Hello and welcome back. Today we are going to talk about a really amazing aspect of virology, reverse transcription and integration. And this story begins way back in 1908 when the first tumor viruses were discovered. 1908, chicken leukemia virus. And in 1911, Rouse sarcoma virus. So the first viruses shown to be able to cause a cancer uh, in these cases, both in chickens. And we'll come back to that story in a couple of lectures. It's really interesting. Rouse, in fact, working here at the Rockefeller Medical Institute, discovered this. These were called tumor viruses. By 1908, we already know what a virus is pretty much, so they called these tumor viruses. And later on, uh, in the 50s, when we began studying viral genomes, we found that these had RNA genomes, so they were called RNA tumor viruses. So that's the beginning of our story. But for many years, people didn't understand how they caused tumors, how they made cells different so that they grew forever, and a key person here was Howard Tammen, who will, we will revisit his work when we talk about viruses and cancer, but he was a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison who recognized that these RNA tumor viruses, now called retroviruses, cause permanent changes in cells that we call transformation, and again, we'll, we'll talk about transformation in greater detail later, and that had to involve some kind of permanent change to the cell involving the DNA. And eventually it was found that retroviral DNA was integrated into the host genome and became a permanent part of it. And Temin coined a term for this, which we've already mentioned briefly, the provirus, the retroviral DNA that is integrated in the cell chromosome we call a provirus. So how this happened was a mystery until Temin and David Baltimore discovered in the particles of these RNA tumor viruses an enzyme, a previously unknown enzyme called reverse transcriptase or RT. So they were both working independently. They both discovered it. They, they both published it uh, in the same issue of Nature. You can see on the left Temin uh, discovered this enzyme, RNA-dependent DNA polymerase and virions of Rouse sarcoma virus. That's the virus Rouse had discovered in 1911. And David Baltimore discovered it, uh, an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. So this was called reverse transcriptase. This was previously unknown. Uh, a couple of years later, the two, these two individuals received a Nobel Prize for this work along with Renato Dulbeco. So reverse transcriptase is the enzyme that countered what we call the central dogma of biology. That is that DNA goes to RNA, goes to protein. That's the flow of information. And retroviruses reverse the flow because they change RNA to DNA, which again, you have to understand, this was amazing to people that this could happen. It was not thought to occur. And so the name retro, meanings were reversing the flow of information. There's actually a group called Retrovirus, a rock band. And one year when I was teaching this course, they were playing a concert downtown. So I gave extra credit for anyone who went. <laughs> About half the class went. Um, and I, every year I look, but they're not around here at this time of year. The, the main singer's name is Lydia Lunch. Retrovirus, what a great name for a band. I wonder if they reverse the flow of genetic information. So we go from RNA to DNA. So now these RNA tumor viruses are called retroviruses. And this enzyme has completely revolutionized molecular biology, not just for retroviruses, as we'll see today, but this enzyme, of course, made it possible to clone mRNAs into plasmids to make DNA copies of any RNA that you want. And it led to being able to make therapeutic products by cloning genes. And today, whenever you do RT-PCR, the RT part is reverse transcriptase. 
RT-PCR, when you want to amplify a small amount of RNA from a clinical specimen or any specimen, it's reverse transcriptase. This is amazing what it has done for science. And these two individuals did not patent the enzyme. Neither one of them patented the enzyme. You know, Jonas Salk was once asked why he didn't patent the polio vaccine. You know what he said? How could you patent the sun? Meaning, this is obvious stuff. We make it for the good of people, and it's there. We just discover it. All right, reverse transcriptase. There are two families of viruses with reverse transcriptase that we're going to talk about today in terms of our Baltimore scheme. Uh, there are others, which I'll mention later. But we're going to talk about the retroviruses, of course, in which RT was discovered. They have an RNA genome that's copied the DNA. And then uh, hepatitis B virus is the other virus with a RT in its re reproduction cycle. This virus has a DNA genome. So we'll get into that towards the end, and you will finally understand why the DNA is weird. It's gapped and it has all those weird features. So let's start with retroviruses. Here's an introduction to the virus particle. There's an electron micrograph on the left. They're, they're enveloped, so they have a spherical shape, and you can see an electron dense center, which is the nucleocapsid. So on the right is a schematic. These virus particles are enveloped. They have glycoproteins in the envelope. Uh, those are called envelope glycoproteins, ENV, and they consist of a SU and a TM part. Beneath the membrane is a matrix protein. It forms this blue shell, gives the membrane some stability. Uh, and then in the center is the nucleocapsid, which consists of an isometric capsid, uh, made up of a single protein, the capsid protein, and within it is the viral RNA. The RNA uh, is coated with a nucleocapsid protein, uh, and, and there are two strands of RNA. So these viruses are diploid. They have two copies of the viral RNA genome. As you can see there, these are plus-stranded RNAs, so it's unusual that they have protein coding them. And uh, furthermore, the reverse transcriptase uh, enzyme is in the particle as well, as well as a protease and an integrase. And we'll talk about uh, the integrase and the RT today. Now, if you take the genome out of the particle, this is what it looks like. There are two general categories of retroviruses, those with simple genomes and those with more complex genomes. And the latter include HIV 1 and 2. And this is an example of a retrovirus with a simple genome, avian leukosis virus, one of the chicken retroviruses that got this whole thing started. So there on the top is a map of the proviral DNA. So that is the DNA as it's integrated into the host cell. And you can see there are two LTRs at either end, long terminal repeats. We'll talk about what they do in a moment. And then you have three main coding areas, gag, Paul, envelope. And these areas encode the structural proteins. The GAG leads to the structural proteins. The PAL includes the enzymes that are needed, including RT and integrase. And then the envelope glycoprotein is coded there. The way this genome is expressed, it is transcribed as it sits in the host cell chromosome as a provirus by promoters that are in the LTR. You get a, a, a viral mRNA produced. And that viral mRNA, full-length viral mRNA, would be packaged into new virus particles. So that's not only an mRNA, but it's a genome. From that mRNA, you get translated the GAG precursor, which you can see is then processed into a lot of smaller proteins. And there is a termination, a translation termination uh, stop signal right after the GAG region. So that has to be suppressed in some way to get translation of the next part, the Paul region. So you get a gag Paul precursor sometimes from which the polymerase is made. And then to get the envelope protein, you actually have to splice this mRNA to remove uh, the gag in the Paul regions. And that's shown at the bottom here. And from that, you get envelope. Now this, these mRNAs, of course, are all made in the nucleus because the provirus is in the nuclear DNA. And so we talked uh, two times ago about how the full-length unspliced mRNA has to have special signals in it to be ordered in order to get out of the nucleus unspliced. So that's the unspliced genome right there. 
So have an overview of the viral reproduction cycle here. Here's a cell, the viruses are attaching to cell receptors. Retroviruses bind to many different kinds of cell receptors. Many of them fuse with the plasma membrane as is shown here at neutral pH. Some of them need to get in through endocytosis. The viral nucleocapsids released into the cytosol. It, it comes apart slightly, but not completely. It becomes porous so that DNTPs can get in and it never is uncoated. It's never released into the cytosol. So that plus RNA uh, is never accessible to ribosomes. It's not translated. What, it, what happens is that it's reverse transcribed in the cytoplasm within the subviral particle to give uh, viral DNA. So that's a viral uh, double-stranded molecule. It's made in the cytoplasm, completely protected by this uh, subviral particle. And then it's imported into the nucleus, and then it integrates into nuclear DNA. And there it is transcribed to form the messenger RNAs that give rise to all the proteins that are needed to make new particles, as well as new genomes that are packaged into the particle. And these viruses are released by budding from the plasma membrane. And we'll talk about the assembly process uh, next time. Let's talk about reverse transcriptase, this remarkable enzyme. It is a primer-dependent enzyme, but the primer can be either DNA or RNA. It doesn't matter. And this enzyme will copy not only RNA, but DNA as well. And you'll see why that's important in a moment. And of course, it uses or incorporates deoxynucleoside triphosphates, the precursors of DNA, not NTPs, which would be RNA. And so there is reverse transcriptase. In the top diagram, looks very much like a lot of the enzymes we've already talked about. And in fact, reverse transcriptase is present, as far as we can tell, in all living things. And we, before we discovered it in retroviruses, it was already in other cells, but we didn't know it was there. Turns out reverse transcriptase is in bacteria, it's in archaea, and it's in eukaryotic cells. You all have RT in you. Even though you're not infected with any infectious retroviruses, you have RT in your cells. So we think reverse transcriptase evolved way before the separation of these three domains of life. So remember, look at the tree of life, bacteria, archaea, eukaryotes. They had a common ancestor at some point a long time ago. That common ancestor probably had RT, and it passed down to uh, all of these three domains. So that's one of the reasons we think that RT is a bridge between the RNA world and the current DNA world. Remember, it was once a world of organisms based on RNA only, and that world existed a long time. But at some point, an enzyme arose that could copy that RNA into DNA, that was RT most likely, and that allowed the formation of DNA-based organisms, which, would grow, which could grow bigger and more complex because the DNA molecules could be bigger. And so on the bottom right here is a a circular phylogenetic tree of reverse transcriptases in different organisms. So we have the viral reverse transcriptase. Uh, we're going to talk about the retroviruses and the hepadenoviruses today. But there's also a plant RNA virus that has reverse transcriptase. The colimo viruses, which include viruses that infect cauliflowers. And uh, that's here spelled wrong. It should be colimo virus. Uh, then there are reverse transcriptases in bacteria and archaea. Uh, and uh, there, there are reverse transcriptases in drosophila, in yeast. Here on the left, lines. These are elements we'll talk about today that we have in us that have their own reverse transcriptase. Your telomerases, the ends of your chromosome that, that are made long by telomerase, the, is, the essential component of that is a reverse transcriptase, and that's shown here as well. So reverse transcriptases are everywhere. They're not just in retroviruses and other viruses. They predate, most likely, those viruses as well. If you look at the protein sequences of, of reverse transcriptase, that's the second line down in this figure, which we've seen before, RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. 
Again, like all the other three classes of nucleic acid polymerase, they look like a right hand. They have some conserved regions that are shown here in colors. In particular, they have an active site. It's the yellow bar here, site C. And in that active site, there is an ASP, ASP pair of amino acids. And that is what <laughs> coordinates the magnesium ions to help the whole polymerization process go. So again, these four groups of polymerase derive from a common ancestor, including reverse transcriptase. In the reverse transcriptase molecule, the same molecule, the same protein, we have another enzyme called RNASH, and that's shown here, RNASH, and this cleaves RNA only when it's double-stranded. It could be RNA-RNA, or it could be RNA-DNA, doesn't matter, RNA-H will cleave it, and this has a very important role to play in reverse transcription, as you'll see in a moment. It makes endo nucleolytic cleavages. It cleaves internally, not at the ends. If it were at the ends, it would be an exonuclease. But this makes cleavages here internally, shown by the red arrows. And it makes short pieces of RNA, which we call oligonucleotides, that have a 5' prime phosphate and a 3' prime hydroxyl. So you can tell by the way this arrow is drawn, you're going to get a 5' prime phosphate and a 3' prime hydroxyl. For our purposes, uh, in today's talk, we're going to discuss how this enzyme destroys the RNA template once it makes a DNA copy. So that's RNA-SH, second activity of RT. Now, of course, we have many different crystal structures of reverse transcriptase. Here's an HIV-1 reverse transcriptase. And this is a dimer of two protein subunits, P50, P66 and P51. And I have colored them in a way representing different domains. We have uh, the fingers domain in blue, the thumb is in green, uh, the RNASH domain is in orange. So you can see the P66 subunit down at the lower left. The, the top figure is the dimer of both subunits. You can see the P66 is at the top here. If you follow the blue uh, alpha helix, the green alpha helix, and the orange, you can see where that fits in. And then the P51 is the other subunit, and you can see the blue, the red, the yellow, and the green components. And together they form the active enzyme with the fingers, the palm domain, the active site, and the thumb domain. So here is shown an RNA template in green coming through the active site. It's going to be going in this end at the top, passes the active site, including those two aspartates, the uh, product is made as a DNA, which is shown in blue here. And the RNase domain is at the right end, on the top in orange, and that's going to then remove the RNA template as it passes out of the enzyme, because it's no longer needed. So one end of the RT, you're adding, making DNA from the RNA template. At the other end, you're removing the RNA because you don't need it anymore. So we're going to make one DNA per RNA molecule. Here's a cartoon of the reverse transcriptase, and it's colored in the same way. You have our fingers and our palm and our thumb domain. The RNA-H domain is in orange, and you can see the RNA coming in on the left side. It's passing over the two metals, which are in the active site, those by white spheres, and then we're making a DNA product. So now we have an RNA-DNA duplex, as it passes through the active site. And then as it passes the RNASH, uh, the RNA is degraded. RNASH also has two metal ions as part of its catalytic site that chops up uh, the RNA. So what comes out is DNA only, not a double-stranded RNA-DNA hybrid. It's just a single-stranded DNA. So the enzyme makes DNA, and then it degrades the template. And some of the properties of this enzyme include that it's very slow. It takes four hours to make a DNA copy of one viral genome. So that virus particle that gets into a cell, there's no DNA until about four hours later. And it makes a lot of mistakes. It makes an error in uh, 10,000 to a million nucleotides. So there can be an error in every uh, DNA copy made. It's an error-prone enzyme. And this will be important later when we talk about, say, the ability of HIV-1 
to escape uh, new immune responses in the infected host. Okay, our first question is reverse transcriptase has revolutionized molecular biology. Which statement about the enzyme is not correct? It's unique to retroviruses. It's packaged in the retrovirus particle. The protein also has RNA-H activity. The name comes from its ability to reverse the flow of genetic information, and it might abridge the ancient RNA world and the DNA world. The only thing that's correct here is that it's unique. Uh, so the only thing that's wrong, sorry, is that it's unique to retroviruses. It's not. It is packaged in the particle. It is. It does have RNA-H activity, and the name comes from its ability to reverse the flow of uh, information. Let's take a look at reverse transcription, starting with the RNA template. Remember, in the virus particle, there are two copies of the viral RNA genome, so we say it's diploid. I've pulled those out, and I'm showing them in panel A here in the upper left. So we, they're both capped at the 5' prime end. They're polyadenylated. They look like messenger RNAs. And in fact, if you, as I said before, if you took these out and put them in a cell, they would be translated. There's no reason why they can't be, except that they're always kept in the particle. Uh, they are bound in the virus particle to a tRNA. That tRNA is shown in olive green here. And part of the tRNA is base pairing with the viral RNA at what we call the primer binding site, or PBS, and that's shown in red. So the PBS is part of the viral RNA that's complementary to part of the tRNA. The tRNA is there because it's going to be a primer for reverse transcription, as you'll see in a moment. So this is a cellular tRNA that's in the virus particle. And it's bound near the 5' prime end of the RNA. And these RNAs are actually base pairing with each other. That keeps them together. So let's look at how that works. Let's go to the bottom part of this figure, part B. The primer binding site is shown in red here. So here's the 5' prime end at the left. The, um, uh, the RNA in this region is highly structured. You can see there's stem loops here, primer binding site. And this loop, SL1, forms a loop that will base pair with the loop of the second RNA in this region, very near the tRNA. So here is this complex, it's called the kissing loop complex, how charming, someone called it a kissing loop complex. There's one of these loops from SL1, uh, and the second will base pair with it. Okay, so those bases are complementary to each other, they form this, these two loops are, are interacting with each other. So there are the loops separately on the bottom and at the top are together. This simply holds the two molecules together during the encapsidation or the packaging process that we'll see later. So this little loop here in SL1, the stem loop 1 of one RNA is going to base pair with the same part of the second RNA. So here are the two stem loops from one RNA and the second RNA and they form, they're complementary so they Base pair, it's a very short base pairing, but it holds the two RNAs together, as you'll see when they're put into a virus particle. So in the virus particle, this, both RNAs are coated with nucleocapsid protein. They're not naked. And there are about uh, 50 to 100 molecules of reverse transcriptase in each virus particle. There's only two genomes. Now, why are there two RNAs in the particle? We think it's because the genome is littered with mutations because the enzyme is error prone, that any one RNA on its own is not likely to be infectious. But if you have two and you can make recombinants between the two, then you're more likely to have an infectious genome. So that's why we think it has two. It makes it more resistant to mutation, either caused by the error prone enzyme or by ultraviolet light or any other insults. Okay, so. On the bottom is what we think happens during reverse transcription. We have two, the two RNA genomes here, and reverse transcription is beginning at, at the right end. It's the blue molecules, the DNA that's being made. The enzyme proceeds from right to left. It's making uh, a copy. And what we think happens is that the enzyme switches very quickly between both copies, back and forth randomly, pretty much. And in the end, you get a DNA that's really a hybrid of sequences from both RNAs. And if there are any mutations, so if A is mutated and you happen to have copied the A from the other strand, then you get around that mutation. So this is called copy choice 
And it, the idea, again, is that it will build a functional genome when maybe each one is, is not infectious because of mutations. That's a theory, difficult to prove, but we don't understand uh, other reasons why there would be two RNAs in the virus particles. So they're identical. It's not like it's a segmented virus where there are two different segments. They're exactly the same RNA, except for different mutations, of course. All right, back to reverse transcription. We start with the primer, which I told you is a tRNA. So at the top in panel A, those are the two complete genomes. So let's focus on the left hand, left hand end of the viral RNA, the five prime end in the middle here. So we have our cap there. And you can see the tRNA is, is base paired with the primer binding site, the red sequence in the viral RNA. But of course, it's not just a linear uh, base pairing. There's, there's a highly involved structure here, and that's shown below. So here is the, the sequence of the viral RNA in this region where the tRNA is going to bind. Um, and you can see it can form a stem loop without the tRNA. The tRNA is in the middle. And when the tRNA binds to this primer binding site, it actually denatures a bit of the stem loop in the PBS region and insinuates itself into it. As you can see here, the tRNA sequences are binding uh, to both strands in this stem loop. And there's the three prime hydroxyl of the tRNA shown there. And that's of course gonna be the primer for reverse transcription. So again, these two RNAs come into, are in the particle and will come into the cell with the tRNA bound. The tRNA of course is packaged into the particle during assembly. Okay, so remember this is very near the five prime end of the viral genome which if you think about it, it's kind of weird, right? Why would you start priming right near the five prime end? Most of the time we prime at the three prime end of a genome. You'll see why in a moment. So DNA synthesis, as I told you earlier, is cytoplasmic. The viruses deposit the nucleocapsid into the cytoplasm. It's, the capsid is slightly permeabilized so that DNTPs can get in and then reverse transcription begins and makes a complete double-stranded DNA copy in the cytosol before it even goes in the nucleus. And I want to now go through the steps of this reverse transcription. It's really what I would say a Baroque process. And it starts here at the left. Here's the viral RNA. One, we're going to look at one RNA just for simplicity. There's the 5 prime N. There's the tRNA hybridized very near the 5 prime N. I want you to look at the sequences that are on this slide. We have primer binding site, PBS, and then U5 and R and U3. And they're, they're written with little letters because in a moment we're going to see the complementary sequences which we'll write in big letters. So the tRNA is bound. The reverse transcriptase uses it as a primer to make a piece of DNA, which is shown in blue. But of course, it reaches a 5 prime end of the genome and it has to stop because there's nowhere else to go. This is called actually strong stop DNA because when it was first discovered, it was a really prominent short band. As the DNA is being made, of course, the RNAsH is degrading the template. So now you end up with a structure like the one shown on the right. You have a small piece of new DNA attached to the tRNA, hybridized to the PBS. Where is it going to go? Well, it turns out that Let's go back here. When you make this DNA, you copy the little r and the, and the little u5, and you make a big u5 and a big r. The, ca the case in the letter just signifies that it's a complement. So big r is complementary to little r. So now when you take away the RNA, you see you have a big r here and a little r at the three prime end of the genome. They will hybridize, and that's going to allow reverse transcription to occur. You know, here we are on the left. And that's called the first template exchange. So essentially, the RT is going from the five prime end of the template to the three prime end of the same template. Because there's a complementary sequence there, you can see it's base pairing. And the RT will continue, continues to copy that RNA. And you can see in the second panel, it's made a long piece of DNA, and it's degraded much of the RNA template. It is left behind this little sequence labeled PPT polypurine tract, and that's going to serve as a primer for the second strand of DNA synthesis. And so if you look at the third panel, the first strand continues around the RNA, but at the same time, this 
complementary or second strand of DNA is beginning using as a primer this PPT. So now we have this uh, structure on the right where we have almost one strand complete and part of a second strand. So let's see what happens next. Uh, so here on the left is where we resume. We have our tRNA uh, attached to that first strand, which has now completed. It's completed by copying the primer binding site. The next step is that the RNA pieces here are removed, the primers, the PPT and the tRNA uh, are removed. This does endonucleolytic cleavage, so it can remove both of these. Of course, the second strand doesn't have anywhere to go. It's reached the end of the template there. But of course, as you might guess, it's complementary to uh, sequences on the other side. So the, this is the primer binding site. So these are complementary. The light blue and the dark blue are complementary. So they base pair, and that will allow the completion of the second strand. So that's the second uh, template exchange. And so let's go to the top left here. We have that second template exchange. Reverse transcriptase is now going to copy the entire second strand. And you end up with a double-stranded molecule shown at the bottom left. So what has happened here, because of these weird events happening at the ends, where you have those two template exchanges, we have generated what we call two long terminal repeats on the left and the right. So the genome has the LTR on each end, and they, the sequences in them are U3, R, U5, PBS, and then PPT, U3, R, U5. If you look at the viral RNA, viral RNA does not have LTRs in it. But here's an RNA to, to compare. Little r, little u5, PBS. And the genome has u3, r, u5. So we've added a u3 to one end of the DNA by virtue of that template jump. Same thing for the, the right-hand LTR. In the RNA, it consists of only PPT, u3, r, and we have PPT, U3, R, U5 because of the other template jump. So having the synthesis set up in this way where the enzyme has to twice jump from one, end, from one template to another allows it to make, to add sequences to complete the LTR. Now why this has to occur is because these LTRs both have strong promoters in them. And those are going to be the promoters that drive mRNA synthesis in the proviral DNA. The promoter is internal to the LTR, so you always lose the left-hand portion, i.e. the U3 portion, when you make the mRNA. That's why it begins with little r, because the promoter starts about there. And the same thing at the 3' end. You lose the U5 sequence. You, start, you stop at the R sequence because there's a termination site for transcription there. So you lose the LTRs, part of the LTRs when you transcribe this, but they're regenerated during reverse transcription. It's really just amazing that this can happen, and it does. Now, if you're confused by any of this, I made an animation a couple of years ago. It's on YouTube where you can see this happening in real time. Not the real thing, of course, but an animation of it, and it might help clarify what's going on. Our next question is, which of the following steps occur during reverse transcription of retroviral genomic RNA? Priming of minus DNA synthesis by tRNA, two template exchanges, degradation of viral RNA by RNase H, generation of two LTRs, or all of the above. Most of you got all of the above, which is the right answer. Everything is right here. tRNA primes minus strand synthesis, that first little piece, two template exchanges at each end, RNase H degrades the RNA and of course, you get two LTRs made by this whole process. So here's a summary, and it'll lead us into what happens next. So at the top, we have our DNA made by reverse transcription with two LTRs and the whole viral coding region in the middle. So this is made again in the cytoplasm. And then it's going to come into the nucleus where it will integrate into host DNA. And so host DNA is shown in this slide as purple, the two strands, and there's a target where this is going to integrate. 
this DNA will integrate into that host target in a, in a process we'll talk about in a moment. That gives you the provirus. Again, that integrated DNA is proviral DNA. And we have, you can see the LTR on the left and the right, the coding region in the middle, host DNA on either side. And there are two features of integration that I want to point out. First, you lose a couple of bases at the ends of the LTR when you integrate. You'll see why when we look at the exact mechanism. So the LTR starts with AATG, but when it's integrated, it's lost the two A's. It starts with TG. It happens at either end. You lose two bases. So if you're sequencing viruses and proviruses, you can tell if an integration event has occurred because that's one cardinal feature. You lose two bases at either end or more. The second is that the host target where the viral DNA integrates is duplicated at either side of the provirus. So here in the second line is the host target boxed. And on the, the third line, you can see it's been duplicated at either end. We now show it as a red and an orange box because that's newly synthesized DNA, as you'll see, which duplicates the sequence at either end. So this host, host target is duplicated, and that's another way you can tell if an integrated sequence was put there by a retrovirus. So this virus, this provirus, has an LTR on either end, and both LTRs have the same sequence. They have a promoter and a terminator. So the left LTR has a promoter terminator, the right has a promoter terminator, and as this sits in the chromosome, this provirus is transcribed entirely by host machinery, PAL2 and associated proteins. It recognizes the LTR containing promoter, the promoter in the LTR on the left end, and it generates a capped mRNA, a capped and polyadenylated mRNA that represents the viral RNA genome. This RNA genome, as I said, misses the two sequences at the ends of the LTRs, so they're regenerated during reverse transcription. But this RNA genome begins at the promoter in the left LTR, and it terminates at a terminator signal in the right LTR. So these signals for transcription have been built into the provirus by reverse transcription. Let's take a look at how this uh, integration event occurs. It's catalyzed by a separate viral protein called integrase. So, so far, the RT has made DNA, the RNase H, which is part of RT, has degraded the RNA. And now we have a separate protein called integrase, which will integrate the viral DNA into host chromosomal DNA. So integrase is a tetramer. There are four copies of the viral protein, and that's shown by this yellow blob here. The viral DNA binds integrase, which is in the virus particle. So as it's made, the viral DNA is made, it's immediately bound by integrase. And then the integrase, once it comes in the nucleus, it also binds host or target DNA, which is shown here in purple. The integrase cuts two bases off the ends of the viral DNA. That's shown in step two here, and it's called processing. So that gives you a new three prime hydroxyl that will attack the host DNA. So that's why we remove some bases from the two ends of the viral DNA. The integrase then nicks the target DNA. So you can see in the next slide, there are two sites of nicking the little uh, orange balls there. And that gives you a place to attach the viral DNA to. So that's shown in the next, the third panel there. You can see now the, new, uh, the newly nicked parts of the cell DNA have been attached to the viral DNA. Uh, they are ligated to the viral DNA. The integrase goes away. And then host repair proteins fill in what's missing. So there, you co there comes your duplication of the sequences at either end, because by virtue of, uh, of attaching uh, the retroviral DNA in a staggered fashion, it leaves you gaps. And those gaps are filled in, and that gives you the duplication of the DNA sequence. And you can see that by the red and the orange. So now we have a provirus 
and it's, it's a viral DNA integrated into the host cell chromosome and is catalyzed by the integrase. As you might guess, as we'll talk about when we talk about antivirals and HIV-1 and AIDS, inhibitors have been made against reverse transcriptase and integrase. And those are very powerful drugs that are being used in various ways. Now, the whole uh, integration uh, process is being ex extensively studied. So we have DNA made in the cytosol, double-stranded DNA, and then it's imported into the nucleus. It goes through the nuclear pore complex. And as soon as it gets in the nucleus, it is chromatinized. It's wrapped around nucleosomes. Uh, and then that is how it will find a place in the chromosomal DNA in which to integrate. So on the left is the overview. So we have our DNA made in the cytosol. Integrase is shown as those four uh, yellow-orange molecules at the bottom of the complex. Uh, you might say, well, why doesn't integrase integrate it into itself, right? Why doesn't that happen? Because, as you'll see in a moment, the integration into host DNA is pretty random. Well, there's a protein that gets pulled into this complex. It's a cell protein called BAF, and that protein compacts the, the viral DNA and prevents it from auto-integrating, which would be a very bad thing to do. It would mess everything up. So this comes into the nucleus. It's now chromatinized. There's the integrase on the bottom there. And the integrase interacts with a number of cellular proteins that bring it to chromatin. Here's the cellular DNA on the bottom here labeled chromatin so that it can integrate into it. And that's expanded on the right here. How this happens is slightly different for different retroviruses. So this is the process uh, for HIV-1. Here is our viral DNA in blue with the, uh, with the histones on it. It's wrapped around histones. And uh, there's the integrase, the four molecules in yellow. And integrase is interacting with two different proteins. One, this protein called LEGF, which is associated with chromatin. So this is bringing it to chromatin. It could be anywhere in the chromatin, but it's also interacting via two proteins uh, with Paul 2 So Paul 2 is here because it's transcribing host cell DNA. It's making mRNA. And so integrase wants to be in chromatin, but it wants to be in an area where it's being actively transcribed, which probably makes sense because it's going to be loosened up. The chromatin will be loosened up a bit. So anyway, the bottom line here is that the viral DNA is brought to the chromatin, the host DNA, by specific protein-protein uh, interactions with the integrase. Uh, there see, dep again, depending on the retrovirus, there are various uh, preferences for uh, where the viral DNA integrates. There's no specific gene that it goes into, for sure. It, it seems to be mostly random. Um, and it, some viruses prefer actively transcribed chromatin. Uh, some prefer to integrate in sequences that are wrapped around a nucleosome, probably by virtue of uh, this interaction with LEGF. So that's how the DNA is brought into the nucleus. And once it's, it's close to the host DNA, the integrase can then do the reactions that I uh, just told you about before. So here's a summary of what we've talked about so far. We have our linear DNA produced in the cytoplasm, comes in the nucleus, it's integrated into a host target by integrase. That uh, viral DNA, the provirus, is then transcribed by host Paul 2 to make mRNAs that will then drive the replication cycle. So one DNA from two RNAs per virion, right? So not terribly efficient. It's one DNA per two RNAs. And as I said, there's a strong promoter uh, built in the uh, LTR during reverse transcription. The proviral DNA is transcribed. And that, MRI goes out, that mRNA goes out into the cytosol and can be translated. But some of it will also be put into new virus particles because that mRNA, the full-length RNA, unspliced, is basically a viral genome. If you look at this whole process, it's quite clear that there is no viral DNA replication. I haven't shown you any DNA replication so far. And there's no viral RNA replication either. This mRNA is not replicating. It's being transcribed to make new RNA over and over again. 
But this is really unusual compared to all the viruses we've talked about so far. The RNA viruses where they have RNA polymerases to make more genomes, and the DNA viruses that have DNA polymerases to make more genomes or use those of the host cell. This is totally different. This is not making, it's not replicating its RNA and it's not replicating its DNA. Now, to be sure, you can make lots of retroviruses from a cell because you keep transcribing the provirus over and over again. And if this cell would happen to divide, it will divide, the retroviral DNA will divide with it because it's being copied by the host cell. But if you look at it from a virus centric point of view, there's no virus specific nucleic acid going on here. It's all carried out by other processes. So here's an overview again, just to summarize. A virus has bound to the surface. The core has come in. The nucleocapsid has come in the cytosol. It's reverse transcribed. The DNA goes in the nucleus. It integrates into nuclear DNA. It's transcribed. Unspliced or spliced RNAs come out of the nucleus. The spliced RNA, in this case, is for the envelope glycoprotein. The, the, vi the protein encoded at the right hand of the genome, and that is a glycoprotein, so it's shuttled up to the plasma membrane through the secretory pathway. And then the unspliced RNAs can make the gag pole and the, the gag proteins, uh, which form the new virus particles. And as I said, we'll talk about that process in some detail next time. This, this provirus is a permanent part of the cell genome. There's no way to get it out. If the cell dies, of course, it's gone. Um, but there's no way to excise it. The, and this is the problem with HIV, is that it becomes integrated into our DNA, and the cells don't die. So it stays there forever. The only way to get out is by transcription. So the viral RNA can be produced, and that can drive the production of new virus particles. So. If, the, if these retroviruses infect the cell and kill it, that's the end of the story. But it's quite clear that not all retrovirus infections of, of many animals, of many life forms here on the planet, are not lethal. And that the animals can not only survive, but in many cases, the provirus integrates in the germline. That means it's transmitted to offspring. Okay, it can be transmitted uh, through oocytes, through sperm, because the, D, the viral DNA has in, integrated into cells that become gametes. All right, and so we call that when the retrovirus, when the provirus integrates into a germ cell, we call that endogenization, and we call it an endogenous retrovirus. That's a specific name for a provirus that's in a germ cell and will now be transmitted to your offspring. And our genomes are full of these, and the genomes of pretty much everything that we've looked at is full of endogenous retroviruses as well. And these are very interesting. I want to talk a little bit about these now. So how does this happen? Well, you have a population of individuals. There are humans here, but it can be any animal on the planet, you get infected with a retrovirus. If it doesn't kill everyone, you will have uh, populations surviving who are infected. And if it enters the germline, if the provirus enters the germline, it will then be passed on to offspring. And so here we have a founder who was infected in red, and that individual has passed, has survived. The provirus is in his or her germline. It's passed on to their offspring and spreads to the population. With time, because the sequences are not essential for the survival of the organism, they will mutate, they will sustain mutations, and that will inactivate them so infectious viruses are no longer produced. So the initial individual was perhaps producing infectious viruses, but with time, and you can see that's reflected by the lighter red color. Uh, these proviruses become mutated, and they're no longer producing infectious viruses. But they're still passed as DNA sequences to offspring. And you can have fixation of these sequences, which means a certain population will always have them. And in some cases, they are lost. And we see this in humans extensively. 
We see it in many other animals as well. As we are sequencing genomes of more and more animals, we see endogenous retroviruses in their genomes. Now, the ones that we have infected us many years ago. The most recent uh, infection is about 200,000 years ago, and there are even infections of our ancestors as well. But there happens to be a, an endogenization occurring right now, as far as we can tell, in koalas. So we, we say it's, it's endogenization in real time. So we think that koalas, in, which are native to Australia, if you see them in a zoo, it's because they came from either another zoo or from Australia, but that's where they originated. Uh, they, we think they got infected about 50,000 years ago with a retrovirus, the koala retrovirus, which came from a mouse. So it's a cross-species infection, and the koalas have been infected ever since, and the virus has gone into their germline and is spreading throughout the koala population. And so if you look at this map of Australia, these pie charts represent the fraction of koalas at different locations that have been surveyed, which have uh, proviruses in their germline, koala retrovirus provirus. As you can see up north, most of the koalas are, are in, endogenized, and then as you move south, uh, fewer and fewer. So the idea here is that the endogenization continues. You have some koalas which have it in their germline, they're spreading it to their offspring, and that is spreading south. Koalas are becoming infected, and they're becoming endogenized, and, it's, and they, spread, they pass on the uh, provirus to their offspring as well. So this is unusual because we've never seen it in real time happening. We've only had ancient remnants or, or uh, evidence of endogenization, and here it's happening uh, in real time. Our genome is full of these, but it's also full of a broader class of related elements called retro elements. Right? A retro element is a sequence that moves around the genome via reverse transcription. Okay, So that means it starts as an RNA, and here's a diagram of that. So you have your chromosomal DNA. It has a retro transposon. It's, that's a sequence that will move around via reverse transcriptase. It's transcribed. You get an mRNA. Sometimes these retro elements have their own reverse transcriptase. So that is translated. It makes DNA. And then it integrates somewhere else in the genome. So these are mobile genetic elements that are RNA-based and that require reverse transcriptase to move around. There are also DNA-based transposons, but these are RNA-based and involve reverse transcriptase. That's why we call them retro elements. And they call this, this is called a copy-paste mechanism, right? Because we're copying this and pasting it somewhere else. There are other, in DNA uh, transposons, you can do cut and paste as well, where you cut out the original one in movement. Anyway, the point here is that these sequences can move around and they can multiply, and they have, because uh, we've, we can see back in evolution that there have been bursts of movements of, of such elements in many animals and many species. Most of these, uh, some of these retro elements are endogenous retroviruses, as I've just told you. Um, and um, in humans, they are all replication defective. They're not infectious. We, we make particles, retrovirus particles from time to time from these endogenous retrovirus elements, but they're not infectious. In other animals, they do make infectious viruses. For example, mice make infectious retroviruses from their endogenous uh, retro elements. Forty-two percent of the human genome is comprised of these mobile genetic elements, which includes endogenous retroviruses and other retro elements that move around by reverse transcription. Forty-two percent of you is mobile. It's amazing. And these are not, most are not encoding genes that have any function. And here's a breakdown of these retro elements. So again, a retro element is just something that moves around using reverse transcriptase. It doesn't have to be a retrovirus. Now, there is a subset of these. By the way, we have 3 million copies of these uh, in our genome, 42%. Endogenous retroviruses are part of this, right? An integrated provirus. Many species that have been examined have these. As I said, we have lots of them, but they're all defective. They don't make infectious virus. Uh, 
Then there are retrotransposons. So let's, the endogenous retrovirus is 7.7% of the human genome. These are from all previous retrovirus infections. Retrotransposons are probably the precursors of retroviruses. They're composed of two LTRs. They have the host DNA sequence on either side duplicated, so they went in by an integrase reaction. But they have gag, pull, but not envelope. So they could make particles, but they could never spread from cell to cell because they have no envelope protein. And so these have probably been there for much longer than retroviruses, uh, the retrotransposons. LTR containing retrotransposons, 8.3%. And then we have lines, long interspersed nuclear elements, which are 17% or 20% of your genome. These, again, have um, duplicated sequences on either side, and they have what looks like a reverse transcriptase. So this is a classic retro element. It can be transcribed. Reverse transcriptase is made. It makes a DNA copy, and then it goes somewhere else. And if it goes in a gene, it's going to have a consequence. And there are already a number of human diseases associated with retro transposition. It's a very rare event. Less than 0.05% of these are active in the human genome today, but it can happen. Then we have signs, short interspersed nuclear repeats. Uh, these are uh, elements that have, do not have their own reverse transcriptase. They are just sequences that are transcribed and then reverse transcribed but by someone else's RT, another endogenous retrovirus or a line and so forth. And finally, uh, a processed pseudogene is simply an mRNA that happened to get copied to a DNA erroneously and then integrated somewhere else. These are all RT-mediated events, and they're examples of mobile elements that move around the genome via that enzyme. It's really quite remarkable. And of course, when retroviruses were discovered, when reverse transcriptase was discovered, we didn't know any of this. We had no clue that any of this was going on. And now, with the ability to sequence genomes, we find that these elements are there, they're pervasive, they can move around, they certainly contribute to mutation, but more likely and more importantly, they probably contribute to evolution. So let me give you two examples or three examples of how that happens. Humans and many other animals give birth to live young. Part of doing that means you need a placenta to allow the, the fetus and the mother to interact during gestation. Here's the diagram of part of a placenta here at the lower right. The outer layer of cells is called the syncytiotrophoblast. It's essential for separating the maternal and the fetal circulation. This is a single la layer of syncytia. You remember that word? Syncytia, fused cells. That's what measles virus does when it infects neighboring cells. It causes them to fuse. This is caused, this fusion of cells to form a syncytiotrophoblast is dependent on a protein that we have called syncytion. And it's a retroviral envelope protein. It used to be a retroviral envelope protein. It was a remnant of an infection a long time ago. So here on the left in panel A is the phylogenetic tree of primates. You can see there have been two captures of envelope over the years. These are infections by retroviruses. They became endogenized. The host survived, obviously. And the envelope gene was exapted. That's the word we use when we take a viral gene and use it for something that we need. So this exaptation of envelope allowed the animals to become live bearers. Otherwise, they wouldn't have had a placenta. And uh, again, the reason this occurs is because the envelope glycoprotein catalyzes fusion of the viral and the cell membrane. But if you express envelope on a cell, it will bind its receptor and fuse the two cells. And that's how the syncytiotrophoblast arose. So without retroviruses, we would not have placenta. We would not be bearing live young. Maybe we'd have them in a pouch like kangaroos do, but we wouldn't be doing placental-based things. So that's one example. More recently, people have found that uh, retro, endogenous retroviruses are expressed during human embryonic development. 
And here is HERV K, which is one of those 8% um, of endogenous retroviruses in the human genome that infected our ancestors pretty recently, about 200,000 years ago. And you can see that on this phylogenetic tree here of us, Homo sapiens, and our ancestors. There's 200,000 years ago. And it is endogenized, and it's in our genome, this DNA, and it's not making any infectious virus. But during normal human embryogenesis, it's, these mRNAs are turned on. The mRNA for this HERV-K is turned on. Uh, it goes from the H cell stage to the epiblast. So here's the pattern of development starting from an oocyte. At the H cell stage, the HERV-K is turned on. You get HERV-K mRNAs. You can actually see particles, viral particles, in these, uh, in these embryos up to the epiblast, the blastocyst stage. And the presence of these viral mRNAs seems to induce an antiviral protein called IFIT-M1, which we'll talk about later. So there's some idea or some sense that this uh, viral mRNA has been exapted to serve as an antiviral defense for the embryo, of course, which has no defense at all at these early stages. So another example, and there are many more of how, as we study them, we find many more examples of how we use these retroviral genes for our own purposes. And finally, if you've ever had a, a blue egg, the blue comes from a retrovirus. The blue, here's a white egg and a brown egg. Those are pretty common, but blue eggs are rare. And what happens in these blue eggs is that a chicken retrovirus has inserted upstream of the gene for the blue pigment. And it turns on the blue pigment, and that is why you get blue eggs. It's a retrovirus. It obviously has no effect on the chicken, but it just happened to insert next to the blue pigment gene. Lots of interesting ways that retroviruses are helping us. Our last question is, which of the following statements about retro elements is not correct? A, there are many copies in eukaryotic genomes. B, they are currently entering the koala germline. C, those in the human genome produce infectious viruses. D, they can be beneficial. E, none of the above. Which is, is not correct. Those in the human genome produce infectious viruses. They do, we do not. Uh, they are currently entering the koala germline is correct. That's the whole idea about we're watching endogenization of the koala in real time. Uh, they can be beneficial. Placenta wouldn't be there without a retrovirus. Let me end up with a little discussion of hepatitis B virus. Another virus with reverse transcriptase in its reproduction cycle. Family name is hepadenoviridae. These are envelope viruses with a nucleocapsid. So far looking like retroviruses with a membrane that has glycoproteins in it. But the genome is DNA. And it's, and it's a weird DNA. It's class seven in the Baltimore scheme, which is gapped and has a protein and an RNA attached to it. And so let's uh, figure out what this has to do with reverse transcriptase. By the way, uh, when you look at cells infected with these viruses, they have some aberrant forms shown at the right, which are composed solely of the glycoprotein. And we have exploited this to make a vaccine against hepatitis B, which we'll talk about later. Now, in the, in the reproduction cycle, the viruses bind to receptors. The nucleocapsid goes in the cytoplasm, binds on the nuclear pore. The DNA goes into the nucleus. It gets repaired by cellular enzymes, so it's now a closed circular DNA. It's coated with histones, and it's transcribed into the mRNAs that are needed to make viral proteins and more genomes. So no integration of hep B DNA. It's got its own promoter in there. It doesn't need to build one by reverse transcription. So here are the, the RNAs that are being made. Uh, one of them is full-length RNA, which is going to be packaged into new particles. And the others make various viral proteins, among which is the capsid protein. So you have assembly of new capsids in the cytoplasm, and the viral RNA goes into those. You can see that right there in the cytosol step 11. But this virus is impatient. As soon as these capsids are made, it starts to reverse transcribe them. There's a molecule of RT in them. And so they make DNA. That capsid with DNA in it 
uh, gets enveloped and sent to the surface via uh, the exosome pathway, which we may talk about next time. The point here is that the RNA is packaged into the particle, just like a retrovirus, but these viruses begin to reverse transcribe it before it leaves the cell, but it doesn't finish, and that's why the particles have a funny genome in it. So let's explore that in the next couple of slides. So here's the viral RNA in panel one. You see it has a lot of repeats on it, very much like the retrovirus genome. At the, the five prime end, there's a cap, and a lot of secondary structure, and here is the reverse transcriptase, this uh, orange protein bound to a stem loop. In the particle, as it assembles in the cytosol, the reverse transcriptase begins to make DNA on that stem loop, but then uh, it never, of course, it's not gonna complete the genome because it reaches the five prime end. So that uh, DNA switches to the other end of the template, which you can see in the next step here, and it, the reverse transcriptase continues to make DNA. It eventually will make that entire first strand of DNA. Uh, a little piece of the viral genome is left uh, as an RNA primer, and that's gonna serve as a primer for synthesis of the second strand of DNA. And so that's shown here. Uh, that on the top is the molecule we just left. The RNA primer is actually gonna switch strands again, and to do so, it's kind of bumped off by the formation of a stem loop. That bumps the primer to the top strand. The reverse transcriptase continues. It reaches the end of the molecule again, but there happens to be complementarity with that five prime end and the three prime end. Uh, and so the reverse transcript, this, this uh, product strand can hybridize to the other strand there, and the reverse transcriptase can continue. So what you see here at the bottom, you have a full um, negative strand, the complement of the message that was first made, and then uh, this second strand never finishes. That dark blue strand never finishes. I think it's because the DNTPs run out, the capsid is eventually closed off, DNTPs can't get in anymore, and so the enzyme runs out of DNTPs and it stops. And so what you are left with is a molecule that is, has one circular or one complete strand, that's the light blue one. The reverse transcriptase is still attached to the five prime end of the light blue strand, and that's what ends up uh, in the virus particles that you can see on the right there. And then there's a gap because the dark blue strand isn't completed. And you can see in the final genome, which is in the particle, the dark blue strand isn't complete either. And finally, that little piece of RNA on the viral genome in the particle, that's the primer that's left over. And presumably would have been removed by RNA-SH, but it never was because this whole process stopped. So two things I want you to remember here. First, there's DNA in the particle because the reverse transcription occurs in the cell where the particle is assembled before it gets out. And secondly, the funny structure of the genome is because reverse transcription uh, is not completed. It runs out of DNTPs and you end up with an incomplete structure that has to be repaired. Now, uh, here is a summary of the uh, there are four major kinds of viruses in which reverse transcriptase is part of the reproductive cycle. So we talked about retroviruses on the lower right. They package an RNA genome and only make DNA when it comes in to the host cell. The hepatitis viruses actually package an RNA genome in the cell, but it gets converted to DNA, so it looks like there's DNA in the virus particle. So the yellow is what is in the virus particle. So for Hep B, there's DNA. And I told you how that gets to be its funny configuration. The top left is a plant para-retrovirus. It is a plant uh, RNA virus with reverse transcriptase in its reproduction cycle. What is packaged is DNA. But in fact, in the cell, these viruses also package RNA, and it starts to reverse transcribe before it even leaves the cell. And finally, at the bottom left are some unusual retroviruses called foamy retroviruses. Five to 20% of the time package DNA. That's probably, again, because they package RNA in the cell as they're assembling. It begins to reverse transcribe before it even leaves the cell. 
So what's in the virus particle is not actually a reflection of what started in the particle because it, it, depending on whether reverse transcriptase begins in the cell before the particle's released or if it begins in the next cell that's infected, that determines what you see uh, in the virus particle. So next time we will talk about assembly of virus particles.